section twenty seven of the world as will and idea this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read for you by chiquito craster the world as will and idea volume one by arthur schopenhauer translated by r b haldane and j kemp the third book the world as idea second aspect section fifty one if now with the exposition which has been given of art in general we turn from plastic and pictorial art to poetry we shall have no doubt that its aim also is a revelation of the ideas the grades of the objectification of will and the communication of them to the hearer with the distinctness and vividness with which the poetical sense comprehends them ideas are essentially perceptible if therefore in poetry only abstract conceptions are directly communicated through words it is yet clearly the intention to make the hearer perceive the ideas of life in the representatives of these conceptions and this can only take place through the assistance of his own imagination but in order to set the imagination to work for the accomplishment of this end the abstract conceptions which are the immediate material of poetry as of dry prose must be so arranged that their spheres intersect each other in such a way that none of them can remain in its abstract universality but instead of it a perceptible representative appears to the imagination and this is always further modified by the words of the poet according to what his intention may be as the chemist obtains solid precipitates by combining perfectly clear and transparent fluids the poet understands how to precipitate as it were the concrete the individual the perceptible idea out of the abstract and transparent universality of the concepts by the manner in which he combines them for the idea can only be known by perception and knowledge of the idea is the end of art the skill of a master in poetry as in chemistry enables us always to obtain the precise precipitate we intended this end is assisted by the numerous epithets in poetry by means of which the universality of every concept is narrowed more and more till we reach the perceptible homer attaches to almost every substantive an adjective whose concept intersects and considerably diminishes the sphere of the concept of the substantive which is thus brought so much the nearer to perception for example oxidit vero in usuanum splendidum lumen solis trahens noctem nigram super almam terram and where gentle winds from the blue heavens sigh there stand the myrtles still the laurel high calls up before the imagination by means of a few concepts the whole delight of a southern clime rhythm and rhyme are quite peculiar aids to poetry i can give no other explanation of their incredibly powerful effect than that our faculties of perception have received from time to which they are essentially bound some quality on account of which we inwardly follow and as it were consent to each regularly recurring sound in this way rhythm and rhyme are partly a means of holding our attention because we willingly follow the poem read and partly they produce in us a blind consent to what is read prior to any judgment and this gives the poem a certain emphatic power of convincing independent of all reasons from the general nature of the material that is the concepts which poetry uses to communicate the ideas the extent of its province is very great the whole of nature the ideas of all grades can be represented by means of it for it proceeds according to the idea it has to impart so that its representations are sometimes descriptive sometimes narrative and sometimes directly dramatic if in the representation of the lower grades of the objectivity of will plastic and pictorial art generally surpass it because lifeless nature and even brute nature reveals almost its whole being in a single well-chosen moment 
man on the contrary so far as he does not express himself by the mere form and expression of his person but through a series of actions and the accompanying thoughts and emotions is the principal object of poetry in which no other art can compete with it for here the progress or movement which cannot be represented in plastic or pictorial art just suits its purpose the revelation of the idea which is the highest grade of the objectivity of will the representation of man in the connected series of his efforts and actions is thus the great problem of poetry it is true that both experience and history teach us to know man yet oftener men than man that is they give us empirical notes of the behavior of men to each other from which we may frame rules for our own conduct oftener than they afford us deep glimpses of the inner nature of man the latter function however is by no means entirely denied them but as often as it is the nature of mankind itself that discloses itself to us in history or in our own experience we have comprehended our experience and the historian has comprehended history with artistic eyes poetically that is according to the idea not the phenomenon in its inner nature not in its relations our own experience is the indispensable condition of understanding poetry as of understanding history for it is so to speak the dictionary of the language that both speak but history is related to poetry as portrait painting is related to historical painting the one gives us the true in the individual the other the true in the universal the one has the truth of the phenomenon and can therefore verify it from the phenomenal the other has the truth of the idea which can be found in no particular phenomenon but yet speaks to us from them all the poet from deliberate choice represents significant characters in significant situations the historian takes both as they come indeed he must regard and select the circumstances and the persons not with reference to their inward and true significance which expresses the idea but according to the outward apparent and relatively important significance with regard to the connection and the consequences he must consider nothing in and for itself in its essential character and expression but must look at everything in its relations in its connection in its influence upon what follows and especially upon its own age therefore he will not overlook an action of a king though of little significance and in itself quite common because it has results and influence and on the other hand actions of the highest significance of particular and very eminent individuals are not to be recorded by him if they have no consequences for his treatment follows the principle of sufficient reason and apprehends the phenomenon of which this principle is the form but the poet comprehends the idea the inner nature of man apart from all relations outside all time the adequate objectivity of the thing in itself at its highest grade even in that method of treatment which is necessary for the historian the inner nature and significance of the phenomena the kernel of all these shells can never be entirely lost he who seeks for it at any rate may find it and recognize it yet that which is significant in itself not in its relations the real unfolding of the idea will be found far more accurately and distinctly in poetry than in history and therefore however paradoxical it may sound far more really genuine inner truth is to be attributed to poetry than to history for the history must accurately follow the particular event according to life as it develops itself in time in the manifold tangled chains of causes and effects it is however impossible that he can have all the data for this he cannot have seen all and discovered all he is forsaken at every moment by the original of his picture or a false one substitutes itself for it and this so constantly that i think i may assume that in all history the false outweighs the truth the poet on the contrary has comprehended the idea of man from some definite side which is to be represented thus it is the nature of his own self that objectifies itself in it for him his knowledge as we explained above when speaking of sculpture is half a priori 
his ideal stands before his mind firm distinct brightly illuminated and cannot forsake him therefore he shows us in the mirror of his mind the idea pure and distinct and his delineation of it down to the minutest particular is true as life itself the great ancient historians are therefore in those particulars in which their data fail them for example in the speeches of their heroes poets indeed their whole manner of handling their material approaches to the epic but this gives their representations unity and enables them to retain inner truth even when outward truth was not accessible or indeed was falsified and as we compared history to portrait painting in contradistinction to poetry which corresponds to historical painting we find that winkelmann's maxim that the portrait ought to be the ideal of the individual was followed by the ancient historians for they represent the individual in such a way as to bring out that side of the idea of man which is expressed in it modern historians on the contrary with few exception give us in general only a dustbin and a lumber room and at the most a chronicle of the principal political events therefore whoever desires to know man in his inner nature identical in all its phenomena and developments to know him according to the idea will find that the works of the great immortal poet present a far truer more distinct picture than the historians can ever give for even the best of the historians are as poets far from the first and moreover their hands are tied in this respect the relation between the historian and the poet may be illustrated by the following comparison the mere pure historian who works only according to data is like a man who without any knowledge of mathematics has investigated the relations of certain figures which he has accidentally found by measuring them and the problem thus empirically solved is affected of course by all the errors of the drawn figure the poet on the other hand is like the mathematician who constructs these relations a priori in pure perception and expresses them not as they actually are in the drawn figure but as they are in the idea which the drawing is intended to render for the senses therefore schiller says what has never anywhere come to pass that alone never grows old indeed i must attribute greater value to biographies and especially to autobiographies in relation to the knowledge of the nature of man than to history proper at least as it is commonly handled partly because in the former the data can be collected more accurately and completely than in the latter partly because in history proper it is not so much men as nations and heroes that act as the individuals who do appear seem so far off surrounded with such pomp and circumstance clothed in the stiff robes of state or heavy inflexible armor that it is really hard through all this to recognize the human movements on the other hand the life of the individual when described with truth in a narrow sphere shows the conduct of men in all its forms and subtleties the excellence the virtue and even holiness of a few the perversity meanness and knavery of most the dissolute profligacy of some besides in the only aspect we are considering here that of the inner significance of the phenomenal it is quite the same whether the objects with which the action is concerned are relatively considered trifling or important farmhouses or kingdoms for all these things in themselves are without significance and obtain it only in so far as the will is moved by them the motive has significance only through its relation to the will while the relation which it has as a thing to other things like itself does not concern us here as a circle of one inch in diameter with a circle of forty million miles in diameter have precisely the same geometrical properties so are the events and the history of a village and a kingdom essentially the same and we may study and learn to know mankind as well in the one as in the other it is also a mistake to suppose that autobiographies are full of deceit and dissimulation on the contrary lying though always possible is perhaps more difficult there than elsewhere dissimulation is easiest in mere conversation indeed though it may sound paradoxical it is really more difficult even in a letter for in the case of a letter the writer is alone and looks into himself and not out on the world 
so that what is strange and distant does not easily approach him and he has not the test of the impression made upon another before his eyes but the receiver of the letter peruses it quietly in a mood unknown to the writer reads it repeatedly and at different times and thus easily finds out the concealed intention we also get to know an author as a man most easily from his books because all these circumstances act here still more strongly and permanently and in an autobiography it is so difficult to dissimulate that perhaps there does not exist a single one that is not as a whole more true than any history that ever was written the man who writes his own life surveys it as a whole the particular becomes small the near becomes distant the distant becomes near again the motives that influenced him shrink he seats himself at the confessional and has done so of his free will the spirit of lying does not so easily take hold of him here for there is also in every man an inclination to truth which is first to be overcome whenever he lies and which here has taken up a specially strong position the relation between biography and the history of nations may be made clear for perception by means of the following comparison history shows us mankind as the view from a high mountain shows us nature we see much at a time wide stretches great masses but nothing is distinct nor recognizable in all the details of its own peculiar nature on the other hand the representation of the life of the individual shows us the man as we see nature if we go about among her trees plants rocks and waters but in landscape painting in which the artist lets us look at nature with his eyes the knowledge of the ideas and the condition of pure willless knowing which is demanded by these is made much easier for us and in the same way poetry is far superior both to history and biography in the representation of the ideas which may be looked for in all three for here also genius holds up to us the magic glass in which all that is essential and significant appears before us collected and placed in the clearest light and what is accidental and foreign is left out the representation of the idea of man which is the work of the poet may be performed so that what is represented is also the representer this is the case in lyrical poetry in songs properly so called in which the poet only perceives vividly his own state and describes it thus a certain subjectivity is essential to this kind of poetry from the nature of its object again what is to be represented may be entirely different from him who represents it as is the case in all other kinds of poetry in which the poet more or less conceals himself behind his representation and at last disappears altogether in the ballad the poet still expresses to some extent his own state through the tone and proportion of the whole therefore though much more objective than the lyric it has yet something subjective this becomes less in the ideal still less in the romantic poem almost entirely disappears in the true epic and even to the last vestige in the drama which is the most objective and in more than one respect the completest and most difficult form of poetry the lyrical form of poetry is consequently the easiest and although art as a whole belongs only to the true man of genius who so rarely appears even a man who is not in general very remarkable may produce a beautiful song if by actual strong excitement from without some inspiration raises his mental powers for all that is required for this is a lively perception of his own state at a moment of emotional excitement this is proved by the existence of many single songs by individuals who have otherwise remained unknown especially the german national songs of which we have an exquisite collection in the hundehorn and also by innumerable love songs and other songs of the people in all languages for to seize the mood of a moment and embody it in a song is the whole achievement of this kind of poetry yet in the lyrics of true poets the inner nature of all mankind is reflected and all that millions of past present and future men have found or will find in the same situation which are constantly recurring finds its exact expression in them and because these situations by constant recurrence are permanent as man himself 
and always call up the same sensations the lyrical productions of genuine poets remain through thousands of years true powerful and fresh but if the poet is always a universal man then all that has ever moved a human heart all that human nature in any situation has ever produced from itself all that dwells and broods in any human breast is his theme and his material and also all the rest of nature therefore the poet may just as well sing of voluptuousness as of mysticism be anacreon or angelus silesius write tragedies or comedies represent the sublime or the common mind according to humour or vocation and no one has the right to describe to the poet what he ought to be noble and sublime moral pious christian one thing or another still less to reproach him because he is one thing and not another he is the mirror of mankind and brings to its consciousness what it feels and does if we now consider more closely the nature of the lyric proper and select as examples exquisite and pure models not those that approach in any way to some other forms of poetry such as the ballad the elegy the hymn the epigram etc we shall find that the peculiar nature of the lyric in the narrowest sense is this it is a subject of will that is his own volition which the consciousness of the singer feels often as a released and satisfied desire joy but still oftener as a restricted desire grief always as an emotion a passion a moved frame of mind besides this however and along with it by the sight of surrounding nature the singer becomes conscious of himself as a subject of pure willless knowing whose unbroken blissful peace now appears in contrast to the stress of desire which is always restricted and always needy the feeling of this contrast this alternation is really what the lyric as a whole expresses and what principally constitutes the lyrical state of mind in it pure knowing comes to us as it were to deliver us from desire and its stain we follow but only for an instant desire the remembrance of our own personal ends tears us anew from peaceful contemplation yet ever again the next beautiful surrounding in which the pure willless knowledge presents itself to us allures us away from desire therefore in the lyric and the lyrical mood desire the personal interest of the ends and pure perception of the surrounding presented are wonderfully mingled with each other connections between them are sought for and imagined the subjective disposition the affection of the will imparts its own hue to the perceived surrounding and conversely the surroundings communicate the reflex of their colour to the will the true lyric is the expression of the whole of this mingled and divided state of mind in order to make clear by examples this abstract analysis of a frame of mind that is very far from all abstractions any of immortal songs of goethe may be taken as especially adapted for this end i shall recommend only a few the shepherd's lament welcome and farewell to the moon on the lake autumn also the songs in the wunderhorn are excellent examples particularly the one which begins o bremen i must now leave thee as a comical and happy parody of the lyrical character of a song of voss strikes me as remarkable it describes the feeling of a drunk plumber falling from a tower who observes in passing that the clock on the tower is at half past eleven a remark which is quite foreign to his condition and thus belongs to knowledge free from will whoever accepts the view that has been expressed of the lyrical frame of mind will also allow that it is the sensuous and poetical knowledge of the principle which i established in my essay on the principle of sufficient reason and have also referred to in this work that the identity of the subject of knowing with that of willing may be called the miracle so that the poetical effect of the lyric rests finally on the truth of that principle in the course of life these two subjects or in popular language head and heart are ever becoming further apart men are always separating more between their subjective feeling and their objective knowledge in the child the two are entirely blended together it scarcely knows how to distinguish itself from its surroundings it is as one with them in the young man all perception chiefly affects feeling and mood and even mingles with it 
as byron very beautifully expresses i live not in myself but i become portion of that around me and to me high mountains are a feeling this is why the youth clings so closely to the perceptible and outward side of things this is why he is only fit for lyrical poetry and only the full-grown man is capable of the drama the old man we can think of as at the most an epic poet like ossian and homer for narration is characteristic of old age in the more objective kinds of poetry especially in the romance the epic and the drama the end the revelation of the idea of man is principally attained by two means by true and profound representation of significant characters and by the invention of pregnant situations in which they disclose themselves for as it is incumbent upon the chemist not only to exhibit the simple elements pure and genuine and their principal compounds but also to expose them to the influence of such reagents as will clearly and strikingly bring out their peculiar qualities so is it incumbent on the poet not only to present us significant characters truly and faithfully as nature itself but in order that we may get to know them he must place them in those situations in which their peculiar qualities will fully unfold themselves and appear distinctly in sharp outline situations which are therefore called significant in real life and in history situations of this kind are rarely brought about by chance and they stand alone lost and concealed in the multitude of those which are insignificant the complete significance of the situation ought to distinguish the romance of the epic and the drama from real life as completely as the arrangement and selection of significant characters in both however absolute truth is a necessary condition of their effect and want of unity in the characters contradiction either of themselves or of the nature of humanity in general as well as impossibility or very great improbability in the events even in mere accessories offend just as much in poetry as badly drawn figures false perspective or wrong lighting in painting for both in poetry and painting we demand the faithful mirror of life of man of the world only made more clear by the representation and more significant by the arrangement for there is only one end of all the arts the representation of the ideas and their essential difference lies simply in the different grades of the objectification of will to which the ideas that are to be represented belong this also determines the material of the representation thus the arts which are most widely separated may yet throw light on each other for example in order to comprehend fully the ideas of water it is not sufficient to see it in to see it in the quiet pond or in the evenly flowing stream but these ideas disclose themselves fully only when the water appears under all circumstances and exposed to all kinds of obstacles the effects of the varied circumstances and obstacles give it the opportunity of fully exhibiting all its qualities this is why we find it beautiful when it tumbles rushes and foams or leaps into the air or falls in a cataract of spray or lastly if artificially confined it springs up in a fountain thus showing itself different under different circumstances it yet always faithfully asserts its character it is just as natural to it to spout up as to lie in glassy stillness it is as ready for the one as for the other as soon as the circumstances appear now what the engineer achieves with the fluid matter of water the architect achieves with the rigid matter of stone and just this the epic or dramatic poet achieves with the idea of man unfolding and rendering distinct the idea expressing itself in the object of every art the idea of the will which objectifies itself at each grade is the common end of all the arts the life of man as it shows itself for the most part in the real world is like the water as it is generally seen in the pond and the river but in the epic the romance the tragedy selected characters are placed in those circumstances in which all their special qualities unfold themselves the depths of the human heart are revealed and become visible in extraordinary and very significant actions thus poetry objectifies the idea of man an idea which has the peculiarity of expressing itself in highly individual characters tragedy is to be regarded and is recognized as a summit of the poetical art both on account of the greatness of its effect and the difficulty of its achievement 
it is very significant for our whole system and well worthy of observation that the end of this highest poetical achievement is a representation of the terrible side of life the unspeakable pain the wail of humanity the triumph of evil the scornful mastery of chance and the irretrievable fall of the just and innocent is here presented to us and in this lies a significant hint of the nature of the world and of existence it is a strife of will with itself which here completely unfolded at the highest grade of its objectivity comes into fearful prominence it becomes visible in the suffering of men which is now introduced partly through chance and error which appears as rulers of the world personified as fate on account of their insidiousness which even reaches the appearance of design partly it proceeds from man himself through the self-modifying efforts of a few through the wickedness and perversity of most it is one and the same will that lives and appears in them all but whose phenomena fight against each other and destroy each other in one individual it appears powerfully in another more weakly in one more subject to reason and softened by the light of knowledge in another less so till at last in some single case this knowledge purified and heightened by suffering itself reaches the point at which the phenomenon the veil of maya no longer deceives it it sees through the form of the phenomenon the principium individuationis the egoism which rests on this perishes with it so that now the motives that were so powerful before have lost their might and instead of them the complete knowledge of the nature of the world which has a quieting effect on the will produces resignation the surrender not merely of life but of the very will to live thus we see in tragedies the noblest men after long conflict and suffering at last renounce the ends they have so keenly followed and all the pleasures of life forever or else freely and joyfully surrender life itself so it is with the steadfast prince of calderon with gretchen in faust with hamlet whom his friend horatio would willingly follow but his bed remain a while and in this harsh world draw his breath in pain to tell the story of hamlet and clear his memory so also it is with the maid of orleans the bride of messina they all die purified by suffering that is after the will to live which was formerly in them is dead in the mohammed of voltaire this is actually expressed in the concluding words which the dying palmyra addresses to mohammed the world is for tyrants live on the other hand the demand for so-called poetical justice rests on entire misconception of the nature of tragedy and indeed of the nature of the world itself it boldly appears in all its dullness in the criticisms which dr samuel johnson made on particular plays of shakespeare for he very naively laments its entire absence and its absence is certainly obvious for in what has ophelia desdemona or cordelia offended but only the dull optimistic protestant rationalistic or peculiarly view of life which will make the demand for poetical justice and find satisfaction in it the true sense of tragedy is the deeper insight that it is not his own individual sins that the hero atones for but original sin that is the crime of existence itself fue el delito mayor del hombre es haber nacido for the greatest crime of man is that he was born as calderon exactly expresses it i shall allow myself only one remark more closely concerning the treatment of tragedy the representation of a great misfortune is alone essential to tragedy but the many different ways in which this is introduced by the poet may be brought under three specific conceptions it may happen by means of a character of extraordinary wickedness touching the utmost limits of possibility who becomes the author of the misfortune examples of this kind are richard the third iago in othello shylock in the merchant of venice franz moore phaedra of euripides creon in the antigone etc etc secondly it may happen through blind fate that is chance and error a true pattern of this kind in the oedipus rex of sophocles the trachiniae also and in general most of the tragedies of the ancients belong to this class among modern tragedies romeo and juliet tancred by voltaire and the bride of messina are examples lastly the misfortune may be brought about by the mere position of the dramatis personae 
with regard to each other through their relations so that there is no need either for a tremendous error or an unheard of accident nor yet for a character whose wickedness reaches the limits of human possibility but characters of ordinary morality under circumstances such as often occur are so situated with regard to each other that their position compels them knowingly and with their eyes open to do each other the greatest injury without any one of them being entirely in the wrong this last kind of tragedy seems to me far too surpass of the other two for it shows us the great misfortune not as an exception not as something occasioned by rare circumstances or monstrous characters but as arising easily and of itself out of the actions and characters of men indeed almost as essential to them and thus brings it terribly near to us in the other two kinds we may look on the prodigious fate and the horrible wickedness as terrible powers which certainly threaten us but only from afar which may very well escape without taking refuge in renunciation but in the last kind of tragedy we see that those powers which destroy happiness and life are such that their path to us also is open at every moment we see the greatest sufferings brought about by entanglements that our faith might also partake of and through actions that perhaps we also are capable of performing and so could not complain of injustice then shuddering we feel ourselves already in the midst of hell this last kind of tragedy is also the most difficult of achievement for the greatest effect has to be produced in it with the least use of means and causes of movement merely through the position and distribution of the characters therefore even in many of the best tragedies this difficulty is evaded yet one tragedy may be referred to as a perfect model of this kind a tragedy which in other respects is far surpassed by more than one work of the same great master it is clavigo hamlet belongs to a certain extent to this class as far as the relation of hamlet to laertes and ophelia is concerned wallenstein has also this excellence faust belongs entirely to this class if we regard the events connected with gretchen and her brother as the principal action also the cid of corneille only that it lacks the tragic conclusion while on the contrary the analogous relations of max to thecla has it end of section twenty seven read for you by chiquito crasto birmingham alabama